two years ago, I was sitting in the Paris Hotel, the Thursday morning that DEF CON was to start, and my phone rang. And I was a little nervous to answer it, because I kind of knew what the phone call was about. And it was my doctor calling me back to tell me that the biopsy that I had had on a lump in my breast the day before I left for DEF CON had come back positive and I had breast cancer. I share this with you because it's what actually ended up starting the research that I did that I'm going to share with you today. For those of you who have never been through chemo or don't know anyone who's gone through it, I think most people know that the, you know, the losing your hair, the throwing up, that's, you know, pretty much everyone knows about that. But there's a lot of other side effects that come with chemotherapy. And one of them is called chemo brain. And the regimen that I was on was uh, ACT, which is adriamycin, cytoxin, and taxol. And another name for adriamycin is doxorubicin hydrochloride. And that's the one that essentially pretty much kind of tries to destroy the mitochondria in your brain. It affects their energy levels, and it results in forgetfulness, memory lapses, difficulty concentrating or focusing on tasks, trouble with recall, remembering words or names. Uh, my team can testify to the fact that there have been many of a time in a conference where I've been like trying to put a sentence together and I cannot recall normal everyday words that most people know. I, I can't pull them out of my head. I'm better, I'm getting better at it, but it still happens. Um, and then also struggling to do more than one task at a time. Um, as a hacker, our mind is our like most valuable tool. So losing my hair, my eyebrows, my eyelashes, even losing both breasts was not as traumatic or devastating to me as starting to lose my mind. So when the chemo ended, uh, I kind of was hoping that it would just kind of all go back to normal and it, and it didn't. So I started to try to research how to heal my brain. And in the process of that, I stumbled upon some research being done at Stanford, and I believe it was SRI International, they were partnered, and they were talking a lot about using the mind for authentication, and I kept like, like kind of putting that to the side, like I really want to look at that, but let's get this fixed first. Once I felt a little better about my own cognitive faculties, I went back and started looking at this research because I was very fascinated by this concept, and I wanted to know how far along they were with it, how does it actually work? I mean, like really, how do you implant a password? How do you do this? So today I'm going to share kind of what I taught myself and what I've learned and kind of some of the like hackability of it or kind of the uh, like where they're at with it as far as actually being a viable option. Um, but the next slide. So a little about myself before I start. I'm a security engineer and researcher with Digital Cloak. And my undergrad is in sociology, which is a psychology of group behavior as opposed to the individual. Uh, my minor was deviancy, which has served me well in this environment. Uh, my grad work and degrees are in security management and cybersecurity. So I kind of came into the security arena from the cyber area kind of late, but it can be done. Uh, the agenda for this talk is going to kind of cover some conceptual groundwork so you can kind of understand some of the research when I, when I share it. I still can't feel the ends of my fingers either. <laughs> it's neuropathy. Um, so last time I spoke at DEF CON, I was actually fortunate enough to have one of the researchers I cited that attended my talk. So if any of the researchers I mention in my talk actually happen to be sitting here, like jump up and wave your arms so we can say hi and maybe have you come up and maybe tell, tell us about your research better than I can maybe. Uh, so cognitive memory, this is, cognition is the mental action or process of acquiring knowledge and understanding through thought, experience, or your senses, or some combination of them. It's knowledge, attention, memory, judgment, evaluation, reasoning, problem solving, all of that. And it can be conscious or sub slash unconscious. It can be in, 
excuse me, it can be intuitive, which is the ability to acquire knowledge without understanding. So if you think of like instinct, or it can be conceptual, so based on ideas or concepts, like if you're in a classroom learning something. Consciousness can be defined from two different ways, biologically or philosophically. So your consciousness from a biological perspective refers to the idea of being like awake and aware of your surroundings and experiences in the people and things in your environment. And philosophically, it can refer more to like having a soul or a sense of self. We're um, going to be focusing on the biologic consciousness here. Unconsciousness is when your ability to maintain an awareness of your environment or surrounding like stimulus is lost. And there's either a complete or near complete lack of responsiveness to your environment or any stimulus. Um, there's a medical concept of being unconscious and a legal concept of being unconscious. So medically, you can be unconscious um, kind of like from uh, like, like a brain injury or perhaps like a drug-induced unconsciousness that they'll do sometimes. Um, but legally, you could also be unconscious maybe if you're impaired from drugs or hypnosis or has anyone in here been like so tired they just can't even anymore? It's, you can't, you're, you're awake and you're standing up and you're like able to function, but your mind just, you're just done, right? So that can kind of go into the area of like legally unconscious in a way. But I'm not a lawyer, so don't try to use that in court. <laughs> Next one. So Sigmund Freud in uh, 1893 was the first to use the term uh, subconscious. And what I thought was really interesting was when I was trying to figure out like where they really drew a line between subconscious and unconscious, it turns out that Sigmund Freud actually used the terms interchangeably because in his native German, it was kind of almost the same word. And now the argument seems to be more of a kind of a semantic grammatical thing than a definitive thing. Um, in general, unconsciousness typically tends to refer to a state of awareness from a medical perspective, and subconscious tends to refer to an aspect of your psyche when discussing more of like a psychoanalytical environment. Um, but if there's any shrinks in the audience who want to argue about it, we can do that later. <laughs> uh, the best I can tell is um, it's more of a grammatical issue than a definitive one, um, but I am going to differentiate in them in this talk. So for now, just think of subconscious as the part of your consciousness that is not currently in your focal awareness. And there was a psychologist named Edwin Locke who put it really well, I think. He called it the alternative storehouse of knowledge and prior experience. And there's two main types of long-term human memory. We have explicit and implicit memory. Oh, that's my, well, you can go. that was my obligatory cat slide for DEF CON. <laughs> Um, explicit memory is also known as declarative memory. Uh, it's conscious, and there's two kinds, epis episodic and semantic. So episodic is more storing a personal experience, like a kiss that really meant a lot to you or that you remember distinctly. And then semantic would be more like data about the kiss or a kiss. Implicit memory, um, does anyone here ride bikes or can you ride a bike? So that's kind of a good example. Um, I do triathlons and we train constantly to get things into our implicit memory so that when you're in the middle of a race, it, you're just your instinct, it kind of takes over. Um, so um, it's basically acquired and used unconsciously and it can affect your thoughts and behaviors. And this is kind of where, when we get to talking about implanting, this is where they're putting the password. Um, one of the most common forms is procedural, which helps people performing certain tasks without awareness of actually performing it. Uh, people use explicit memory throughout the day, like remembering an appointment or recalling an event from you know years ago. Um, and implicit is more like an unintentional, un subconscious form. So if you remember a specific driving lesson you had, that's an example of explicit memory. But if your driving skill improves as a result of that lesson, that is more the implicit memory. Okay, memory is a tool versus memory as an object. Um, 
there's, they've put forth that you can use it kind of both ways. So memory is treated as an object when you're recalling or recognizing like an actual memory. But then if you're talking about using it to serve as an authenticator, this is more like where you would use it as a tool. And so why is this important? Because they're looking at this research as being considered potentially a subclass of behavioral biometric measurement. So this is where we're going to start to connect with the idea of implanting passwords as an option. So we're going to talk about encoding, storage, and retrieval. So with encoding, this is processing information into the memory. And there are several different ways of encoding information. There's structural encoding, which is how something looks. And an example would be if you had a word, is it long, is it short, is it all uppercase or lowercase, is it handwritten, is it typed? Then mnemonic encoding is how something sounds, so like how does a certain word sound? And then semantic encoding focuses more on the meaning, and it requires a deeper level of processing than structural or, or mnemonic, um, and it usually results in a better memory because you're kind of creating an association. Storage is after the information enters your brain, it has to be stored or maintained or forgotten. So there's a three-stage model that was proposed by Richard Atkinson and Richard Schifrin. It's often used to describe this process. This is my attempt to make a, a representation of it. So essentially, you have sensory memory, short-term memory, and long-term memory. Sensory memory stores the incoming sensory information in detail, but only for an instant. The capacity is very large, but the information in it is unprocessed. Visual sensual memory is iconic memory, and auditory sensory memory is called echoic memory. So then you get to short-term memory, and some of the information in sensory memory can transfer into short-term memory, and that can hold information for about 20 seconds. And rehearsing is a way that you can kind of keep information in your short-term memory longer. So an example is like if someone, like if you're parking your car and you're trying to remember like where did you park your car and you're walking to whatever and you're like P2, 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 P, it's kind of like a way to kind of keep it in your mind and get it in there a little better. Uh, short term memory has a limited capacity and it can store about seven pieces of information, give or take. And these pieces of information can be small, such as like individual numbers or letters, or larger, like familiar strings of numbers or words. So like if you're think, trying to remember the word cat, you're not going to remember C-A-T, you're going to remember the word cat and with the, the visual. <clears throat> so information can be kept in your working memory while you process or examine it. And then once you're done with it, it either is pretty much forgotten or it moves into your long-term memory. Uh, Long-term memory has an almost infinite capacity, and the information usually stays there for the duration of a person's life. However, the big issue is it's there, but you're not always able to retrieve it, which is where the chemo kind of affected me, was the data was in there, I was just not able to pull it out, and that's what I was struggling with. So with retrieval, that's the process of getting the information out of your memory, and they have these retrieval cues, and those are stimuli that can kind of help you remember, um, and they include associations, context, and mood. Next slide. So context is, um, you can try to remember an event by putting yourself in the same context you were when it happened, such as if someone lost a paddle from last night, and they're trying to remember where it is. <laughs> Sorry, that was for my boss. Um, they could kind of go back to like where they remember they had it last and walk through if they can remember where they went next and see if they can find it along. Or you can do the same with your car keys if you've ever lost them. Um, associations, this is our equal opportunity, gratuitous, sexy photos. I hope I hit most everyone in the audience. Um, if not, I'm so sorry, but I only had so many slides and so much time. Um, but the brain stores information as networks of associated concepts, so recalling a particular word can be easy if another related word is recalled first. So here's an example. If, you, if I show you guys like these sunbathers on the beach and then I ask you to spell the word bear, you may be more likely to spell B-A-R-E instead of B-E-A-R because the picture kind of primed you and associated you to that particular spelling. And then there's mood. So um, if you're in the same mood you were during a particular event, you can have maybe an easier time recalling the event, like kind of a nostalgia type thing if you think about it. Here's our other cat. They told me I had to put so many cats in and so many sexy photos, so I tried to make sure I got them all. 
Um, next slide. Okay, the human brain has about a billion neurons in it, and each neuron forms about a thousand connections. <clears throat> and this is about somewhere around a trillion connections, I think. Um, the challenge is, is if each neuron could only store a single memory, running out of space would be a huge problem. So you might only have maybe a few gigabytes of storage space, like about the same as an iPod or a USB flash drive. But because the neurons combine so that each one helps with many memories at a time, it exponentially increases your brain's memory storage capacity to something closer to about 2.5 petabytes. And the example, I think it was something like 300 million hours of, was it 300? 300 million hours of television shows is about the capacity to store in there because of the way the neurons can connect. So, time check? We're doing okay. All right. There are some limitations to memory. Um, I think everyone in here has seen that gorilla basketball video. So that's like inattentional blindness or the illusion of attention. You focus so much on one thing, you completely miss other stuff going on. Sorry. There's false memories. There's um, the illusion of confidence, which interestingly enough, apparently that's the opposite of imposter syndrome. They have one. Um, the illusion of cause, there's a tendency to make uh, casual connections between related facts that maybe are not accurate. Um, so this is where I want to get into the research. Uh, one word, concept, vocabulary thing is called brain-computer interface. So the initial motivation behind brain-computer interfaces was to develop the communication devices for the severely disabled. Seeing as that I only have a limited time to speak, I won't go into the deep dive about how an individual can train their mu and beta brain waves to control a cursor. And there's some fascinating stuff around visual evoked potentials. Uh, but there's a plethora of research out there if you're super interested in that level of granularity. Um, but I did want to point out there is some research by Dr. J.R. Wolpow. Um, and his research team as a starting point, and then Dr. Niels Burbaumer with the Thought Translation Device. He's with the University of Tübingen in Germany, and he has created this device that allows users to compose phrases and sentences electronically just by thinking them. So he's neat. And you may also want to look at a paper out of Dartmouth College about the Neurophone. It's a brain mobile phone interface using a wireless EEG headset and in their paper, his team shares the details of a brain-controlled address book dialing app they created. So the point is, this is a super huge area of research, but I haven't heard a lot of it on kind of our side of the house as far as the security of these things. Um, but I did want to share the four key pieces of research that I found to be the most interesting and with the most potential. Next slide. Next slide. Um, first, there's this, wait, go back. Oh, yeah, go. So first, um, I'm going to murder this man's name, so I apologize ahead of time, but Hristo Bozhinov at Stanford was working with some cognitive scientists at Northwestern University, and they designed a game that looks similar to Guitar Hero. And this is called CISL, Serial Interception Sequence Learning, and it's an authentication procedure that they created this testing experiment around, and they used Mechanical Turk through Amazon to do their experiments. So I'm not sure how well that looks as far as like how you're able to look at your subject pool from an experimental perspective. Okay. I'm trying. I'm like all up on it. Um, I do want to walk you through how it works, but um, I want to make sure I get it right, so I want to read it. The process of learning the password involves the use of a specially crafted computer game that resembles Guitar Hero. There are six buttons, S, D, F, J, K, and L, and the user has to hit the corresponding key or note when the circle reaches the bottom fret. So during a typical training session of around 45 minutes, a user will make about 4,000 keystrokes. And around 80% 80, 80 of these keystrokes are being used to subconsciously teach you a 30-character password. Just leave it. No, go back. Before running, the game creates a random sequence of 30 letters chosen from the S, D, F, J, K, and L with no repeating characters. This equates to around 38 bits of entropy. 
Um, and the 30 character sequence is played back to the user three times in a row and then padded out with 18 random characters for a total of 108 items. The sequence is repeated five times and then there's a short pause and the entire process is repeated six more times. And by this point, the experimental results suggest that a 30 letter password is firmly implanted in your subconscious brain. The authentication requires that you play a round of the game, but this time your 30 letter sequence is interspersed with other random 30 letter sequences. To pass the authentication, you have to reliably perform your sequence. The research shows that even after two weeks, you're able to recall the sequence. The next one is past thoughts. So this, this is from Berkeley, 2013. This technique combines three factors, something you know, which is a thought, something you are, your brain patterns, and then something you have, which is the EEG sensor for measuring the brain waves. To authenticate with a past thought, you think your secret key while using the sensor. The key can be just about anything, a song, a phrase, or a mental image, and the thought itself is never transmitted, just a mathematical representation of the electrical signals your brain makes while you think it. Now, if someone else were to figure out what you were thinking, they still couldn't impersonate your past thought in theory because every person thinks the same thing differently. So, you know, we could all think about the same song, but we're not all going to think about it exactly the same way as far as being registered electronically. Time check. Okay, so this is how they did this one. The following tasks were repeated five times in each session for each subject. They had a breathing task, so they had to close their eyes and focus on their breathing for 10 seconds. They had a simulated finger movement, so subjects imagine in their mind that they were moving their right index finger up and down in sync with their breathing without actually moving their finger. There was a sports task where they selected a repetitive motion from a sport of their choosing and they imagined moving their body muscles to perform the motion. Then there was a song passage recitation task, an eye audio tone task, an object counting task, and then at the very end they had a past thought, which they were asked to choose their own past thought, like a password, but instead of choosing a sequence of letters or numbers, they thought of a thought, like a vision of their wedding or their child being born or the first time they got drunk or what have you. And that they had to think about that for 10 seconds and then everything together became their past thought. So this was some other interesting research that was done that kind of fed into the next one. It was on the feasibility of side channel attacks with brainwave computer interfaces. Um, I do have these papers cited at the end of my slide deck, so if you look them up on the torrent, they'll be there. Um, but it studied the possibility of side channel attacks using commercial EEG types of headsets to reveal users' personal information like their banks, ATMs, or PIN digits. Their approach was similar to a guilty knowledge test where items familiar to a user are assumed to evoke different responses as compared to items that are unfamiliar. And so for example, when a person was shown images of many banks, the brain response to the image of their bank had more of an interaction or um, evoked a higher like potential with the waves. The problem with their attack setup, it was as intrusive and it could be easily detected by the user, but that brought us to PEEP. So PEEP built upon their research and what they tried to do is create an actual keylogger slash malware. And this actually um, was on phys.org in June 29th. Um, and I'll read from the article, it's a quote. Researchers at the University of Alabama at Birmingham suggested that brainwave sensing headsets, also known as EEG, need better security after a study reveals hackers could guess a user's passwords by monitoring their brain waves. So in contrast to the research I mentioned on the previous slide, the folks at the University of Alabama wanted to test out a more surreptitious, less intrusive approach that only required passive monitoring of brain signals as the users type pins or passwords. And so they called theirs PEEP, which is passively eavesdropping private input via brainwave signals. And this was University of Alabama and I think one gentleman from California Riverside. Now, they extensively reference the research of the previous group with the side channel attacks, and they named their keylogger PEEP. And so according to their paper, 
as the use of these devices, which they're referring to the EEG gaming and entertainment devices headsets for any of you who game, it becomes mainstream, a user may enter passwords or private credentials to their computers or their mobile phones while they're wearing these devices. And so they were studying the potential of introducing a malicious app to capture those EEG signals and then process the signals to infer the sensitive keystrokes. So uh, the gentleman and his team used one regular store-bought EEG headset that like anyone could buy at Best Buy or what have you, and then they also used a clinical grade headset in their experiment, and they were able to demonstrate how easy a malicious software program could passively eavesdrop on your brain waves. So while typing um, your inputs, it could sense all of this, and I think he was, so a quote from the article, in a real world attack, a hacker could facilitate the training step required for the malicious program to be the most accurate by requesting that the user enter a predefined set of numbers in order to restart the game after pausing it to take a break, similar to the way a CAPTCHA is used to verify certain users are logging in. Their research showed that after a user entered 200 characters, Algorithms within the malicious software program can make educated guesses about new characters the user entered by monitoring the EEG data recorded. The algorithm they created was able to shorten the odds of a hacker guessing a four-digit numerical pin from 1 in 10,000 to 1 in 20, and increase the chance of guessing a six-letter password from about 1 in 500,000 to roughly 1 in 500. So, security posture versus a rubber hose type of crypto analysis. The challenge in testing their hypothesis is that as far as I know, especially at Stanford, there's no studies that actually allow you to beat people during an experiment. Um, so I think in a way they were kind of sexifying their paper title, you know, no shade. Um, but after a long discussion with a psychologist friend, my current opinion with Sisal, which is the guitar hero in past thoughts, is there seems to be some dependence on the consistency of the entry of the authentication. And by introducing an actual rubber hose type attack or some other similarly traumatic level of extraction, this could affect the brainwaves themselves. So the ability to perform the action or the entry in a manner consistent with the password was set up it could affect that, thus rendering it, you know, you, even if you have it, it's not going to work because it's not matching the brain waves. Because if you're relaxed when you're going through the implantation, but you're being beaten with a rubber hose, even if they get the string, it's going to be different. Um, so starting with the, the Sisal or the Guitar Hero, they were able to test retrieval, but not under stress or trauma. And they were able to test basic coercion um, trying to like fool the system, and that went pretty well. The potential tax against that one involved the use of remote authentication approach, whether or not the attacker is allowed multiple extraction attempts, if there's performance gaps, eavesdropping, none of this stuff's been tested, just the retrieval's been tested. Um, with past thoughts, a hacker might be able to defeat the system by using a phishing scheme that would trick you into thinking your past thought, capturing the output, and maybe later playing it back. Um, and it was pointed out by the PEEP research team that the approach being used by them and the side channel attacks, um, my brain just went dead. Uh, the, the stuff is generated to, for implantation with a random generator. So you could probably go after it from the source by going after the random generator that, that issues it versus the actual person who has it, if that makes sense. As to Sisal and past thoughts, they're still in a mostly theoretical stage as far as research and experimentation goes. I didn't really see anyone addressing how memory could be affected by such things as drug use or injury or even degradation, such as if you have an employee that's going through chemo and suddenly their brain is affected, would they even be able to, to use any of this? Um, would that affect the authentication pattern? Um, so. It, I don't really see this being viable for use at large right now until some of those questions are answered. And um, like one, you know, we're all here at DEF CON, so what happens if you are, have the password implanted while you're sober at work, but then 
you've had a couple drinks and you need to finish a proposal, are you going to be able to authenticate or will being drunk or kind of drunk or even just slightly impaired affect that ability? And that was another thing I didn't see um, addressed. Uh, cost was another big thing. It's all well and good to propose this, but what's the exact cost associated with implementing something like this? And like, would it be realistic to deploy? So with CISL, the training or encoding time was noted to be 45 minutes. And with past thoughts, it was two 40 to 50 minute sessions. And so if you have a small organization, five, 10 people, that might be okay. But I'm like trying to picture Lockheed Martin or something trying to do this with thousands of people trying to put each one of them through that. Um, with CISL, there are certain people this probably would work best with, but factors such as mental capacity or psychological issues. Um, my sister-in-law works with special needs adults who do stuff at the airport and have to go through security checkpoints. So especially with like the guitar hero type of thing, would there be certain people that just wouldn't be able to authenticate this way, just legitimately, they just, from a handicap perspective, they can't do it. You know, even some of our wounded warriors, like, who don't have hands to do this kind of intricate type of authentication. And then things like Parkinson's, seizures, what if the individual's blind and can't even see? I mean, I, I didn't really see any of this addressed as far as, like, using it in a real world on a large scale. Um, all in all, I think it's fascinating with potential, but the research is still in a pretty early stage. Um, the sample groups also, if anyone here, grad school, scientific research, test groups. So the CISL size experiment number one was done with 35 participants. Number two had two groups, 32 and 80 participants for a total of 147, but they didn't clarify if any of those were duplicates from the first to second experiment, so it actually might have been a smaller, a smaller group number. Um, based on my own experience, I'm not sure 147 represents a solid sample other than whether or not it warrants further study. I do think it warrants further study, but so far it's still very theoretical. The past thoughts material I read was based on research on a group of a total of 15 subjects. The side channel attack research had 28 subjects, and the PEEP research had a whopping 12 subjects. So again, this is still really kind of in very theoretical stage, and a pool of 12 subjects to me is not a huge sample size from a research perspective, except for maybe to, to do further research. Um, my thoughts around hackability, CISL refers to the rubber hose, I just really don't see that. I don't, I don't see how they really addressed it. I think they just used the word because it sounded cool. Um, the theory that the knowledge is not consciously accessible to the individual, I'm still not sure on that. Um, I have a psychologist friend, and he's in agreement with me. Like, if you can put it in, you can take it out. Um, and there's ways to do that. Uh, for CISL, a good potential attack vector might be the, the, again, like I said, the random number generator or the random password generator. And in their paper, the past thought team pointed out they were not vulnerable to shoulder surfing because their system was invisible, but they felt they were very vulnerable to both social engineering and dictionary attacks as their system stood. However, it was their hope that with advances in signal recording and processing technology, it would allow for a much more detailed capture of the thought itself, and that would protect better against some of the dictionary attacks. And they also felt they were fairly vulnerable to phishing attacks, where if you could get someone to click on something and record their thoughts while they were clicking, they were kind of vulnerable from that perspective. CISL's not designed to prevent eavesdropping or shoulder surfing attacks. So I imagine a good video recording of them performing the sequence could allow an attacker to replicate it. And considering how many security video cameras are insecure, this is like definitely a distinct possibility. And I believe they did say that in some of the experiments, the, the error ratio was just enough that if someone knew that person's sequence, there were times they were able to impersonate it. Um, I talked to my, sh my psychologist friend about um, using hypnosis to potentially extract it. That I've done a little more research into, and I'm not sure that's really a viable like, vector. 
Uh, but he and I are actually still discussing that at length, so maybe I'll have more on that in the future. Another thing, CISL's a flash application. So I'll just put that right there. <laughs> um, that was my first big, like, okay. Um, and CISL's authentication project, uh, pro process is potentially vulnerable to attack um, if even an untrained person is able to, like, mimic or degrade their performance to match the person they've watched authenticate. Um, and then the authentication based on keystroke dynamics, similar to authentication based on the, the thought, the past thoughts. Um, so it looks at their typing rhythm and what they're thinking at the same time with the, so I don't know, I, I think they just, just still need to do more research. So in closing, I think much of this is still in the experimental stage, and it's going to be really interesting to see if anything actually comes of it, especially considering trying to deploy it across a, a large environment or organization, or a very varied population, like a bigger sample size than 12. Um, check my time. So some of my research, I have the papers. There are links to them, but you don't have to click them. Uh, you can just Google the name of the paper in Google Scholar, it'll come right up. And then the last thing I wanted to leave you with is, it was kind of interesting, about halfway through my research, someone mentioned to me, oh my god, have you read this? It's a book called Hard Boiled Wonderland and the End of the World. And it was written by Haruki Marukami, and it's actually from 1985. 85. And what I thought was really interesting is it's, I'm not going to spoil it if you want to read it, but it's a parallel narrative type setup. One of the narrators is called a Calcutech, and it's a human data processor encryption system who's been trained to use their subconscious as an encryption key. And the other narrator is a newcomer to a strange, isolated town. And I'll leave it there so I don't spoil it. But if you find this interesting, I actually thought it was pretty fascinating that back in 1985, even like fantasy authors were thinking about the idea of using the mind to authenticate and for encryption. So that's all I have. I can do questions now if anyone has them.